Okay, I'm back again here. Uh, this is, <laughs> uh, we had some technical difficulties here, so I'm redoing this entire lecture. Uh, so excuse me if I'm a little frustrated here, but, uh, we'll get, we'll get started again from, uh, from the beginning. Uh, I guess I'll go to the, uh, document camera. I think that's where I started my last lecture. which is this lecture. Just a bit of a dither here. Okay. All right, this is where I started the last lecture. Uh, this is a map of Africa here. Uh, just a kind of a review here. This is the lakes area where human evolution began, and you get migration southward and then northward and out into the uh, rest of the world. Now, the part of African history that most of us are familiar with is, uh, is ancient Egypt. And this is the New Kingdom at its greatest extent, all the way down through what they called Nubia, all the way up to modern-day uh, Turkey. Uh, we've gone through that, but uh, where we're going to pick up Africa now is on the medieval period. Uh, one interesting sidelight here is uh, the impact of uh, Egypt. Uh, even traces of the Egyptian language have been found all the way here in Senegambia on the far west coast of Africa, a distance of 2,500 miles. Um, another significant uh, part of uh, this part of African history is the Bantu migration. Uh, the Bantus occupied the co <laughs> coastal area here and then migrated southward and eastward. <coughs> the reason for not going northward is twofold. You have very strong uh, kingdoms right here in the savannah, which we'll talk about. And you also had the Sahara Desert there. So there was a, a need for the population to move and expand, and they expanded all the way to the coastal area. I wound up talking about uh, the Bantu uh, hybrid culture that evolved on the east coast of Africa here at the end of this lecture. But this is one of the major things uh, that we're going to discuss here. It is uh, these are routes across the desert. In every place you see one of these little dots, that's an oasis. Okay, that, that's where the water is. And, and really, uh, uh, there are lar fairly large settlements, and you, you basically have a, a hot but very uh, tolerable climate. You've got trees, uh, fruit trees, dates, figs, uh, and, and you can support the, even the, a degree of agriculture uh, with that. Uh, and if you know where the oases are, you can make your way across the desert there. Now, the uh, two things that were traded, as you can see here, salt, common in the desert, very expensive, very important. Cheap today because huge sources of salt have been found and there's easy transportation. Here, these are one of the few sources of salt and the transportation was slow first by horse, which wasn't very effective, and then eventually uh, by camel. Now, the commodity that's not cited in here is two-thirds of all the gold in the world came out of sub-Saharan Africa. And so the salt and the gold trade were a major source of wealth uh, for these uh, kingdoms that emerged here. And you have these very sophisticated trade routes, mostly north-south, but also you do have an east-west component here along the coast. And then there was also a southern Bantu trade route that went this way. But for our purposes here, we're just going to talk uh, about those trade routes uh, across the desert. Now, again, this is an important uh, development. Uh, in the 600s, Islam spread out of Arabia all across the coast. Uh, 
up into Spain, even into France. But it did not go very far to the south because of the desert. Um, and and kind of was stymied there. It did make its way down the Nile, and it did even cross here. In fact, one of the first Muslim uh, communities outside of Arabia was founded here on the uh, near the Horn of Africa. So uh, Islam was slowly evolving and developing and coming across. The important thing about Islam is it was spread across the Sahara slowly uh, by these Sufi merchants who were no more anxious to reveal the trade routes to anybody else uh, as were the existing Savannah kingdoms. And the Savannah kingdoms uh, beginning with Ghana, were uh, the beginnings of what we know of as African history. Because as we've defined it, history begins with written records. It's supported by archaeological records and evidence, even oral traditions. But uh, the real histories here begin, oh, approximately 1100. Because that's the, that kind of coincides with the Sufi uh, bringing of Islam across uh, the desert uh, to, to the Muslim, uh, to the Savannah kingdoms. Now you had uh, the ruling class converted to Islam because they were the ones who were most in need of literacy. And, uh, the, you know, as the, the important thing, it's just in a lot of ways like uh, Christianity. If you can convert the king, if you can convert the emperor, then the rest of the population is going to follow, uh, particularly among the merchant class, the ruling class, etc. But when you got to the outskirts of the major trading towns, etc., you get kind of a hybrid religion. And in the rural areas, polytheism remained as characteristic. So you had this kind of split, a ruling class that was solidly Muslim. You had areas, uh, you know, the military, etc., places that were relatively close uh, to the major metropolitan or trading areas that were a hybrid between the rural polytheism and the indigenous uh, Islamic religions. So, uh, and, and that dichotomy still exists uh, and is one of the reasons why you have in post-colonial Africa uh, some of these same sorts uh, of problems. Okay, As I said I'm a little flustered here because I had get, did this whole lecture once and then it uh, tanked because his computer not recording it. Okay, I just gotta do a quick look on this map as you can see. We've talked about these Nilotic kingdoms here. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a proliferation here in the Savannah area. And the, the reason for that is they were the middlemen. Uh, you had trade coming from the coast this way. You had trade coming from the coast this way. These kingdoms made out by being the middleman and by controlling access to those trade routes that I had up here. Uh, on the computer screen or on the document camera there beforehand. Okay, the first of these major kim, uh, kingdoms here is Ghana. Okay, this is the modern day country of Ghana. Uh, 
it's close but not in the same place as traditional Ghana. When it became independent, uh, they just took the name because it was at one time a, a powerful and influential uh, empire. But they sit here in a position where they control access to the gold mines, and they control access to the south uh, salt trade, and they control access to the coastal trade here and the control coastal trade here. So uh, Ghana, uh, which may have existed from the fourth century onward, uh, was in its heyday by the eighth, ninth century of the uh, of the Common Era. But the Ghana Empire grew wealthy by taxing the Trans-Sahara trade. That is the trade across the Sahara, uh, the Sahara Desert. Looking for a map here, and I'm not seeing it. Oh, here you go. Here is that map. Uh, again, pretty much a north-south trade, uh, but also there's an east-west component to it as well. The point being here, trade in Africa was largely land-based. One, because there are very few uh, ports, very few rivers that would allow for trade to, to, uh, to occur and give shelter uh, and, and access. Uh, you have the Senegal, the Gambia, and then further south you have uh, the Niger River, uh, which I'll get to in a bit. So Ghana, uh, you know, had this little monopoly of controlling trade and access uh, to, to trade. And again, as they say, there's, there's always biases in everything. Mine tends to be economic. Uh, I see that as the driving force in, in many, many cases. By the 11th century, by, the, by around 1000 or so, um, Ghana was in decline, and uh, they were attacked by the Berbers. The Berbers were the uh, tribal element that existed between the Muslim empires here on the coast and the Savannah Kingdoms. Now, they were uh, Muslim, uh, and they were one of the great warrior forces uh, in Africa for, from the whole med medieval period and even onward. Uh, and they were not a kingdom themselves, and so therefore they weren't able to, uh, they contributed to the demise of Mali, uh, but were not uh, able to take over and replicate it. So that takes us next to the Mali Empire. Uh, as you can see here, Mali uh, controls much of the Niger River, which takes trade this way and facilitates trade upward. And it goes all the way to the coast, controlling both the Senegal and the Gambia Rivers uh, right here. And you now see the addition of two major cities, Timbuktu, which becomes the university and the uh, great library of Western Africa, and then Gao, which is the major trading port along the uh, Niger River. The modern-day country of Mali is right here, uh, so technically uh, there's some accuracy there, but it doesn't include this whole uh, part here. But uh, what's uh, significant here is that you now start to get uh, the kind of history, the kind of recorded history that you find uh, in China, in India, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Europe, etc. And Sundiata is one of the major leaders that expands that and takes over the land and, and creates this large empire there that now uh, has a monopoly in that it can block any trade going uh, in either direction. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, he, he's kind of the major uh, founder there. Now, the other ruler besides uh, Sundi, uh, Sundiata, okay, and this is in the successor state of Mali. Mali was able to get the Berbers under control, in fact, drive them out. And uh, this was done first under the leadership of Sundiata, and then the big game changer here, Mansa Musa. Uh, 
uh, Mansa Musa was a devout Muslim, and as a devout Muslim, uh, he needed to make his once in a lifetime pilgrimage to the to to uh, to Mecca. Um, and to, to Mansa Musa, Islam was an entry into the cultured world of the Eastern Mediterranean. In other words, he wanted to expand his knowledge and probably his trade uh, scope uh, further uh, into the Mediterranean world. He'd become aware of it from uh, reading about it, but he'd never been to those places. So his, uh, his uh, pilgrimage was twofold, religious and economic as well. Now, it claims to have included 60,000 men, 12,000 slaves, each carrying four pounds of gold bars, etc., uh, etc. Et I would have to say probably not that large, but even if it was six or 12 or 20,000, it's a huge procession that he took along with him, and an amazing testament to the amount of wealth that he had. Uh, one of the, the legends about him is that he had a big giant gold nugget that he tethered his horse to uh, when he was at rest. Uh, there. Uh, he ended up in uh, Cairo and Medina, uh, and they had so much money that the merchants in Cairo and Medina basically gouged them, uh, raised their prices, uh, and what you had for about 20 years after Mansa Musa, because he passed through one way and he passed through coming back the other way, was a period of inflation where they drove the price of everything up because they had great demand and they had great resources and so the price of everything went up. And then once they left, you had an inflationary issue where the average Egyptian and the average Arabian uh, had some difficulty uh, in doing that. But Mansa Musa accomplished his goals for himself. Uh, but what he did is he created an awareness of the huge amount of wealth that was in those Savannah kingdoms, and of course, uh, that's going to create a problem because uh, the, you know they, they asked the bank robber of the 1920s and 30s, John Dillinger, "Why do you rob banks?" And he said, "That's where the money is." And once the rest of the world found out where the gold was, um, they began to try to find ways to get there and to uh, uh, try to get to the gold. Uh, so, uh, Mali uh, prospered during that time period, but you now had uh, a period of time where uh, the outside world would start to come in. Uh, that did not ha happen immediately, however. As you can see here, there is a successor empire. Songhai, we'll go up here, and uh, Songhai spreads all the way from the coast, from the two coastal rivers here, controls the Niger River almost from its source, further down uh, even than Mali had, and then he expands both to the east and to the north, not for any uh, strategic, well, not for any economic region, reason but for protection. These are the routes, these are the places where the oases are, uh, and he's able to keep outside intervention come on and uh, from coming in. And Songhai is by far the largest and by far the wealthiest of the Savannah kingdoms uh, that, that existed. I see my lights went out here, let me move, try to get the lights on. There they go. These lights, if, there, if there's no movement, the lights go out. They think that there's nobody in the room. The lights can't hear me. So uh, we, we have that. So uh, you, you've got the, the, these, these areas that exist. And eventually, Songhai comes to collapse. And we'll talk about that uh, later on, because it's part of the whole big uh, the big picture that we're going to try to get to. Uh, this is an example of some of the goods that were traded. These are African textiles. You can tell by the, the color pattern and design, uh, very much abstract, uh, very, very uh, durable, long-lasting, and they're part of the whole trade uh, amount. Uh, 
I guess I need to go back here just a little bit. And the, the other source of wealth here, besides the salt trade and the gold trade, is now goods coming from here to here and from here to here have to go through Songhai and they tax it both ways. So uh, they become wealthy from their own efforts, but they also become uh, wealthy for the same reason that the Middle East became wealthy. You tax the goods going both ways, and you have a very prosperous, and probably the emperor of Songhai, he's up, up in the top four or five uh, wealthy rulers from the, the emperor of China, probably the Ottoman Empire, probably Montezuma, uh, probably one of the Persian emperors. Uh, the Songhai, the emperor of Songhai is going to be uh, right in, uh, in line with that. But unfortunately, it's something that was not to, to last. Uh, go through all these. Okay, uh, next I want to go to the what is called the Horn of Africa. Oh, here it is. And it's called the Horn of Africa because it looks like a rhinoceros horn, and yes, that's where the trade in rhinoceros horns uh, developed. Uh, and it was always in high, high demand in China believe it or not, rhinoceros horns there. Uh, but you had development here, Somalia, which is this country that kind of wraps around the Horn of Africa. But then you have the, the very interesting uh, place of Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia's history in this time period is very different from the rest of Africa. Um, just going way back, we'll go back to pre-Islamic pre Africa. This entire area from Ethiopia all the way up the Nile River, all the way across North Africa, was Christian from its days in the Roman Empire. And Christianity had worked its way all the way down to this area. But what happened, as we saw from the uh, document camera here, once Islam came out uh, of Saudi Arabia, it spread to the east, but it also spread across North Africa and then eventually worked its way down the Nile River until it got to Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia was in a kind of a highland area. It was able to defend itself and it remained a Christian enclave throughout the medieval period from the uh, six and seven hundreds, all the way through the age of discovery, uh, which we'll get to here uh, in a little bit. So uh, Ethiopia, because it was, it's, it's kind of interesting in that it's uh, Eastern Orthodox in ritual, custom, etc. But uh, because it uh, was before the Great Schism of 1054, it always remained, retained a uh, loyalty to the papacy. Now the contact was minimal. Uh, hardly anybody even knew it was there. It was almost had a semi-legendary status. But once the Age of Discovery came in, uh, it was protected uh, from exploitation because of its protection by the Vatican uh, there. And I'm going to go to now, if I can get there, the... Uh, I don't want to get to uh, the northern. What I want to look for here are the Swahili states, and I don't know if I'm going to get it this way. Well, I guess I'll have to go this way. I don't want to because then I'm going to have to 
trying to click on Swahili Coast and I'm not getting Swahili Coast. Oh, there it is, Swahili Coast. Okay, here's a small little island outline here of the Swahili Coast. This little diagram here doesn't do it, ju do it justice. Its influence went all the way up to the Horn of Africa and really down here into almost uh, extreme uh, southern Africa. It's a, it's a very unique and distinct uh, culture uh, that evolved. Um, if you recall, we talked about the Bantu migrations, the Bantu culture uh, being forced because of the power of the Savannah Kingdoms, the desert population explosion, etc., to move south and then east before reaching all the way here to the Swahili coast what became known as the Swahili Coast. Well, as they are arriving there, the Bantu-speaking Africans, they run again into the Sufi uh, Muslims uh, who are trading, who are merchants here uh, along the coast. And uh, what develops is a very mutually beneficial economic arrangement. And again, I'm gonna leave that up there because just as the Sufis brought literacy in Islam, uh, they also, to Central Africa, to Western Africa, they brought Islam to the Swahili, Swahili coast. And again, this is the beginning of written history because with the Quran, with Islam, comes literacy. And of course, if you're a trading culture, you want literacy because that's necessary uh, for you to keep records uh, etc. And rather than a large empire, these became a collection of city-states. And you had a hybrid culture. Okay? The hybrid culture was the merchants mostly spoke Arab. You did have a few Persians coming in. Um, and the Africans spoke Bantu. And what you got was a hybrid language, Swahili. Swahili is the, it's a combination of indigenous Bantu languages, and it's not the same all up and down the coast, but it's similar enough that you could communicate. And it's uh, uh, an Arabic, Muslim, Persian uh, influence with strong African. Uh, influences, and so it becomes a separate language, uh, which allows the Arabs and the Persians to communicate with Africans, and now the Bantus, the Swahili, are able to communicate with the traders here on the interior of Africa. And so you have a very uh, lucrative trade that kind of bypasses the savanna and comes across the lower savanna here to the east coast, and then it becomes part of the big international trade network uh, that has evolved, and it lasted a good 500 years. Now, uh, why did they remain city-states? Well, there wasn't any outside threat. There weren't any outside attacks. Uh, the Bantus were glad to trade with Swahilis. The Arabs were glad to trade with Swahilis, and so they existed as these very prosperous, very well-governed uh, city-states. So um, you, you, you have a, a situation that, just like the Savannah Kingdom, is very prosperous, uh, paralleling developments in, in other parts of the world, uh, completely independent, uh, really, to a large extent. This is the, the kind of the era of separate, uh, separate cultures, separate identities. Okay, I want to go to a, to a couple things here. I'm going to hit the computer tab here in a minute. But uh, 
This map here, uh, this was the map of the world that uh, Columbus used, okay? Um, and, and as you look at it, it's not terribly uh, inaccurate here. Uh, this is the part of Africa that they know. Here's the Red Sea. Here's Arabia. Now, they don't know what the heck's going on over here in India, and they know China's kind of over here. But as you look at it, Columbus thought that this ocean was the opposite side of this ocean over here on the other side of China. He was off by about one half the size of the world. But he wanted to get to India. And as we'll see, uh, he wasn't far off in pulling that off. Now, here's the motivation for the Portuguese and for the, uh, for the Spanish. Okay. These are the millennia old trade routes that existed. This, we've talked about this. This red is the Silk Road from China. Uh, into the Middle East. Uh, and then this is a later developing seaborne trade. Uh, you have China trading with the islands here. You have the islands trading with India. And then you see here, this is the Swahili coast. They, are, they basically have a monopoly on trade from Africa to India and vice versa. And they have major impact of the trade going this way. So you can see where that prosperity comes from. But um, the Europeans have been largely cut out after the fall of Rome, uh, where they were part and parcel of this. They were the western end of it. Uh, it kind of died out. But the Crusades created an awareness of this and of the, the vast possibilities for trade and wealth, which the 200 years of European occupation here of the, this part of the Middle East brought a great deal of prosperity to Italy, particularly to Europe, particularly to the city-states of Europe, um, and uh, uh, created a motivation as the island of Cyprus here where they learned how to grow sugar. Unfortunately, after they lost it, uh, no more sugar uh, going into, uh, uh, into Europe, except that which was paid at a very high price. But let's, let's just talk about this. Java, to this day, remains the major producer of pepper in the world. And we'll just do a hypothetical. And the hypothetical isn't that far off. A farmer grows pepper in Java, or cloves or cinnamon, whatever it might be. And he goes to the uh, island of Sumatra, or he goes to Malaysia. And he sells, he, he sells it in his market for a dollar a pound. That merchant then goes to Malaysia, he sells it for $2 a pound. When he goes to Sumatra, he sells it for $4 a pound. When that merchant goes to India, he sells it for $8 a pound. When it goes around the southern part of India, it's now $16 a pound. When it gets to Asia, it's 32, uh, Arabia, it's $32 a pound. When it gets to Constantinople, it's $64 a pound. And when it gets to Venice, in Genoa, it's $128 a pound, and when it gets to the rest of Europe, it's $256 a pound. So it's a very, very expensive item. Now, why are spices so important in, China, in Europe? Europe had gotten to the point where it could feed itself, but it was a very, very bland diet. Wheat, rye, barley, uh, very little meat, uh, very little variation. Uh, often in hard times, it was diluted so that you were almost drinking a wheat soup of some kind, and so uh, spices and things you could add to it would give it a degree of flavor and palatability that didn't exist uh, without those spices. Now we'll go to another interesting little map. This is one of the most influential books ever written. This is The Travels of Marco Polo. Uh, Marco Polo, we've talked about him before. He's a Venetian merchant. He eventually makes his way into China to Beijing, and he has a stroke of luck. The Mongols have taken over the Yuan Dynasty, and he becomes friends with Kublai Khan. He becomes one of his trusted ministers. Now, why? Why is the Mongol going to trust an Italian? Uh, what he, what he uh, does is not trust the indigenous Chinese. Uh, they actually hate the Yuan, and the Yuan only lasts about a century before they're booted out. But during this particular heyday of the Yuan, Polo travels the entire length and breadth of China uh, and eventually decides it's time to head home. And as he heads home, he comes by the seaborne route. He's going down this way, 
He goes to this, uh, through the straits here, goes to India, and eventually finds his way back to Ennis, where, Venice, where he brings spaghetti with him. And yes, Chinese lo mein is where the Italians got spaghetti from. It's not an indigenous uh, European product. And then he writes his book, The Travels of Marco Polo, and the people who read it, the Renaissance scholars who read it, came to the conclusion that this ocean over here was the opposite side of the Atlantic Ocean and that you could perhaps sail across the, uh, the Atlantic and get to China or get to India and eliminate the middleman. Okay, that, in a nutshell, you know, like the guy that uh, does the commercials for the original mattress factory says, I get the best mattress is cheapest because I eliminate the middleman. And Columbus and the various other European explorers were trying to do much the same thing. And again, this was their world view. They thought that this was the entire world. They didn't quite know how far Africa went down, but they thought these were the two opposite sides of the oceans. Uh, we have the medieval ages there. Yeah, one interesting little uh, sidelight here. I'm not going to dwell a lot on it. The uh, Here goes the lights again. I'll move around and get those lights on in a minute. I had to walk halfway across the room. Um, what I have here is, uh, it doesn't show it in detail, but uh, uh, Chinese Admiral Cheng Ho. Uh, he was of the same mind as the uh, Europeans. He, he wanted to know more about the world and expand trade. And he did a series of voyages uh, to India, to Persia, and he even got as far as the east coast of Africa around 1450, which is interesting because that's the same time period that the uh, Portuguese were coming around the west coast of Africa. It would have been an interesting change in history uh, had the two, two uh, cultures clash there around southern Africa. But this is one of those important little decisions is that on this voyage, when he got back to China and reported to the Ming Emperor, he said, the Ming Emperor said, there's not a lot there out there that's better than what we do. So I'm not going to waste my money uh, on these voyages. I'm going to extend the Great Wall, make sure I don't have more trouble with the Mongols, and then I'm going to deal with those doggone Japanese pirates. And so uh, what the Chinese do is isolate themselves, and it doesn't hurt them for a couple centuries, uh, but eventually causes them big problems when they get into the 19th, uh, 19th century. Okay, uh, this is uh, another set of trade routes. If you can see, Genoa and Venice dominate. They control the trade in the Mediterranean, and particularly Genoa out here into the Atlantic. And then they're the guys, they're the end of that caravan trade and sea trade, and they're making the big, huge profits uh, out of it. And uh, once Spain and Portugal are able to uh, finish the Reconquista, where the last Muslim forces are driven out, um, uh, they then decide to try to find an alternative route to get uh, get by the price gouging here of the Viennese and the Genoans. Now, one of the important guys, whoops, I'm talking here and I don't have the computer on. These are the Venetian trade routes in green and the Genoese here in red. And Columbus is from Genoa here. He's Italian. He's not Spanish, even though he sailed for Spain. 
one of the guys that's very important, and I guess I'll go back to this, is Prince Henry the Navigator. Um, he's the number five or four son in line to become king of Spain. In other words, he's never going to be king of Spain uh, because of the system of primogeniture. So what he does is he negotiates with his father, who's glad to do that. He gives him an island here off the coast of Portugal. Uh, he then hooks up with the Knights Templar, who are the big international bankers due to their efforts during the Crusades here, and they finance his uh, voyages of discovery. So important guy here. I guess I'll erase the Islamic stuff here. is Henry the Navigator, Prince Henry. And Prince Henry uh, decides that his best, well, best route to fame and fortune is uh, not warfare, but to try to figure out how to uh, get to the southern terminus of this, this uh, trade network that goes from northern Africa all the way down to the African coastal kingdoms and more or less try to bypass these uh, savannah kingdoms here. Now, one of the, the important things to realize, back to it now, one of the important things to realize is that the Europeans were in no way, shape, or form capable of imposing their will on any of these African kingdoms. Number one, there's only a couple ports of entry, uh, Senegal, Gambia, and Niger rivers, controlled by very powerful kingdoms, which could easily have fended off any Portuguese attacks. Second of all, Europeans do not have immunities to yellow fever and malaria, very high death rate if you spent any degree of time uh, in, uh, in tropical Africa. So um, the, the Portuguese are very tentative and careful as uh, they move around uh, the, the coast of Africa. Uh, as it says here, but in 1297, the Portuguese Reconquista was completed. That's by 1300. In Spain, it's almost 200 years, 1492, uh, before they, they go on. Um, there were also... Uh, the, the bubonic plague in the 1300s had devastating effect in Portugal, really cutting down on land trade. So they, they focused on the maritime or the uh, seafaring uh, means of transportation and trade. Uh, they discovered the Canary Islands. In 1415, they are actually able to control the port of Quetta on the uh, coast of Africa. And Henry the Navigator. Uh, here's a picture of him here, Prince Henry the Navigator, and he is the guy, you know, I said fourth or fifth, he was the third child of uh, King John of Portugal, and uh, decided to, to turn his son over uh, to exploration. And uh, they picked, uh, they first discovered the island of Madeira, uh, then the Azores, and began to use these as bases of operation before they worked their way down the west coast of Africa in there. Uh, the Portuguese voyages of discovery continued after Prince Henry, but here's the, uh, and I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of this, the story here, but this is one of the reasons that the Portuguese and later all Europeans were able to um, sail where no one else did. This is called the caravel. And it doesn't look like much, okay? The, car the caravel uh, 
could sail into the wind. I don't know if any of you are sailors, but it's called tacking. And we don't need to go into details about this. But as you can see, the sails on this can be maneuvered and turned. And if you're heading into the wind, you turn the sails like a 45 degree angle into the wind. And it blows you sideways, but at the same time it's blowing you sideways, it blows you a little bit forward. And then you switch the sails to 45 degrees in the other direction, and it'll blow you um, forward again. Uh, it's a kind of a zigzag port, so you, you tack this way, and then you tack this way, and you tack this way. And eventually, you very slowly are able to go in a relatively straight line while zigzagging uh, in it. But the other big capacity where the advantage was it had this hold down here. Much of the ship is below the waterline, which can control supplies, which takes your point of no return further. And the definition of the point of no return is the time where you have only enough supplies to go forward, not enough to go backward. Very trying time when you're out there in exploration. But this caravel was one of the reasons that the Portuguese were able, and then the subsequent Europeans, were able to uh, do what they did and take advantage of the situation. So uh, the Portuguese worked their way slowly around uh, the coast of Africa. And a major turning point occurs here in the 1450s, and I'll, I will double back to this, OK? Yeah, same sort of thing. Uh, as I said, the Portuguese, this, uh, they've been able to make an inroad here. And then they have the islands off the coast, and they're coming around here. And they find these two unoccupied islands right out here, uh, Principe and Sao Tome. They're two small unoccupied islands. Uh, not really of, of any use uh, to any of the cultures that existed along the coast. But again, uh, the, the other thing to realize, go back here. Again, here are the two islands. They're, they're inside this little circle here. Um, the, span, the, the Portuguese recognize that they have to stay on good terms with these people here because uh, they need their cooperation to make a profit. And the, the other thing about these voyages of discovery, they were joint stock companies. That is, you didn't have these guys going out there just, hey, let's discover something. What they wanted to do was find a way to make money. Remember those trade routes I put up? They're trying to find a way to get around those trade routes to eliminate the middleman. And they're laboring here from the early 1400s to the mid-1400s, and they haven't even got halfway around the coast of Africa. So uh, they're struggling, and people are losing money. And uh, what the uh, Portuguese explorers and the Knights Templar, the Knights Hospitaller who are helping to finance them, figure out that these two unoccupied islands, Principe and Sao Tome, are perfect climactically to grow a product that had been very uh, profitable here in the island of Cyprus during the Crusades, and that was the production of sugar. And so, again, if I'm slow on getting back to the computer, that the climate here was even better than the climate here on the island of Cyprus, where they had made their fortune, really, in selling sugar, growing sugar and selling sugar to a European market at a discount rate. So uh, what they wanted was a sugar plantation. They had the climate, they had the crop, but they lacked one important ingredient, labor. Uh, there weren't a lot of Portuguese wanting to go down to the tropics where they might die of disease and work on a plantation uh, in a climate to which they had not 
uh, been accustomed. And so the Portuguese fell upon a, a strategy uh, here. And uh, they took advantage of the situation. Okay, we're back to the document camera. Oh, I hit the power button, that's why. It's going to say wait here a minute. And then it'll have the uh, the map of Africa here uh, that I want to get up. What, what the Portuguese, as they slowly came around uh, the, the bight in Africa, I guess I'll go to the, there we go. As they slowly worked their way around here, they began to develop trade relationships with these smaller coastal kingdoms, which were the economic and, to a certain extent, the military rivals of Songhai and these uh, Kenan Burno, uh, some of these internal kingdoms that, that uh, had a monopoly on the trade across the Sahara. So they began to trade with the Portuguese, uh, who could go around, bring goods from Europe, and bring vice versa, Africa to Europe, Europe to Africa, and they're bypassing the Savannah kingdoms which is starting to make an economic impact. There is less trade to tax. Uh, their neighbors are coming up with their, these goods. They're, they've got steel swords, steel axes, uh, to a certain extent guns, luxury items, etc. And so uh, they're feeling a little bit threatened by this change in these five, six hundred year old trade patterns that, that have existed. And so the Portuguese are able to take advantage of that. They, they need labor. So what they do is there's negotiations with the Savannah Kingdoms, Songhai in this case, who raids out into the areas that aren't under their direct control, and then they take people from the central West African area to the coast, where they then trade those people for European manufactured goods. And of course, they, the Portuguese um, are able to grow sugar and make fabulous profits off of that, and the Savannah Kingdoms are able to uh, hold their own for a while. And, and this is the beginning of from about 1500 to 1850, what is known as the Atlantic. Slave trade. And uh, lasts about 350 years. And again, and it's hard to, again, from a 20th century, 21st century perspective, to understand that this was a business. It was a joint stock company in which uh, European investors would purchase manufactured goods to be traded with the Savannah Kingdoms for people, and then those people were transported across the Atlantic. Uh, to the Americas. Now again, why, why in the world did this happen? And you'll see here this is a uh, long-term diagram here of the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, from mostly West Africa, but really all parts of Africa. Uh, Africans were to the tune of 15 million. The Atlantic slave trade, 15 million to the Americas. And then there's a separate slave trade to the Middle East. So, what, what the Age of Discovery meant for West Africa was a wholesale depopulation of Africans being shipped across the Atlantic, the most going to Brazil. Out of the 14 million total, uh, probably 8 or 9 million ended up in Brazil because you can see it's the closest and it's the Portuguese colony here of Brazil. But then there's also a Middle Eastern trade that goes across the Sahara into the Ottoman Empire. Portugal is the only European country that had significant amounts, uh, about 200,000 African slaves, uh, which were, uh, slavery was then banned by the papacy, and uh, 
those slaves just intermarried into Portuguese population and vir virtually genetically disappeared. Uh, uh, and they were assimilated into the Portuguese culture. But you got another 14 million uh, going here into the Middle East. And you now have uh, the African diaspora. Before 1500, 99% of the Africans lived in Africa. By 1850, you have Africans, not necessarily in every part of the world, but certainly the Americas, the Middle East, uh, even into Asia. And uh, uh, this worked, uh, as you can see here, uh, very much to the demise uh, economically of the African kingdoms uh, that existed at that particular time period. So uh, you've got that particular issue uh, that goes on. Uh, the only benefit you can say is that the crops, the Canadian, the uh, Colombian exchange, potatoes, corn, sweet potatoes, uh, which are very similar to yams but aren't the same thing, uh, at least biologically, uh, tomatoes, all those sorts of things uh, significantly reduced uh, famine, uh, not only in Africa but uh, in southern Asia, China as well. So that, that's a positive uh, outcome of the uh, of the age of discovery, but that African slave trade really uh, it contributes to an economic device, demise that really uh, Africa is yet to fully recover from. Oh, I guess uh, I'll go back to the document camera here. Now, why in the world did you need all these Africans in America? And we've got talked about that in the last chapter. Uh, the reason for that is diseases brought from the old world to the new to people who had no immunities created a 90% plus die-off of the indigenous population. Again, why did Europeans sail? They sailed to make money. They sailed to make a profit. And just as the Portuguese used slave labor to support the sugar plantations on Principe and Sao Tome, the uh, Spanish and later the English needed slave labor to make economic gain out of their colonies in the New World. And so uh, the motivation for the African slave trade was uh, kind of a subset of the economic imperative of profit making to, uh, to enrich these uh, Western Atlantic uh, powers. And as you can see, what happens over the course of that 300-year period of the African slave trade is wealth is transferred from Native American empires to European empires, African empires to European empires, Asian empires into European empires. And so the age of discovery is a huge period of economic growth and economic development uh, for, for the nation states on the coast of, uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, but uh, over the centuries produces a real demise uh, for those cultures. Now, the, uh, the other part I want to get this, the last thing I'll go to here is, I'll go up here I think it is, maybe not, nope. I guess I better do it this way. Okay, this is uh, the guy we all know about. These are the four voyages of Christopher Columbus. Okay, and uh, why did Columbus sail west while the Portuguese were taking the shortcut around Africa? Simply because Ferdinand and Isabella in uh, uh, January uh, 2nd, 1492, fought the Battle of Granada and the last Arab uh, forces left Spain for northern Africa. And they had no desire to get into a war with the Portuguese looking for a route around Africa. So Columbus shows up, a Genoan sailor, and says, hey, I know a better way. I'm going to sail west, and I'm going to end up in India. And that's why he called the people he met Indians. 
And it's kind of fashionable to poke fun at Columbus because he was a long way from India. But as you recall from that first map I showed you, this is how big he thought the world was. He didn't know about these two continents and then the Pacific Ocean. And so he set out, if you look, he would have landed in India where the world, the size he thought it was. So he was a pretty good navigator, just uh, he wanted to believe something uh, that wasn't true and he probably should have been able to figure it out himself. So now you have the stage set for Portugal and Spain to, uh, to enter into a, a conflict and uh, the papacy enters the fray recognizing what European forces will have a tendency to do and he kind of keeps the peace for about a hundred years. The uh, Treaty of Tordesillas, now I'll flash to the instructor camera here, now right up here on the board. Uh, And in the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Spanish and the Portuguese decide to divide the world in half, uh, with basically under the dictates of the papacy. Uh, everything between the purple lines is to go to, to uh, Portugal, and everything to the west is to go to Spain. Now, did the Pope know what he was giving away? Heck no, he had no idea. As you can see, he moves it a little bit west because the Portuguese found that as they went around uh, Africa, there were better winds out here than if they hugged the coast. Uh, and as they got more bold, uh, they went further out. Uh, in one storm, they got blown onto the coast of Brazil, uh, and the papacy then decided to extend that line a little bit further west so that they got Brazil. On the other side, the Spanish had already landed in the Philippines, and so the line was adjusted so they got uh, the Philippines there. But it prevented any European warfare over colonization for about a hundred years. Uh, but if you notice, France, the Netherlands, Britain, the Scandinavian countries, they're not in on the process, and of course that eventually leads to, to warfare. Uh, the other thing that it does is that the Portuguese and the Spanish have just finished the Reconquista. Whoops, I didn't switch to the computer. Darn. Okay, here, here's the, uh, the map I was showing. This is Brazil with the extension, this to the west, and then this is the uh, Philippines with the expansion to the, uh, to the east there for uh, the Spanish to be able to uh, uh, control the Philippines. As I said, the Pope didn't know what the heck he was giving away. He was just trying to stop a war. But the Spanish and the Portuguese had just finished the Reconquista. And as I said, on the borders, uh, Islam and Christianity have been at war with one another uh, on a, on a, almost continuously. Not in the heartland areas, but on the borders. And Spain and Portugal were for six, seven hundred years the border. And so, um, they, as they came off of this, uh, there's a dual motivation. Uh, first, they're going to spread Christianity. And this is the period where Christianity experienced its greatest growth with the eventual conversion of virtually by either conversion or migration, North and South America becoming major Christian enclaves. Uh, and then you now have the fueling of the fight as Christianity comes down here along the coast of Africa and Islam comes this way. You have a battle that continues uh, to this day. But where things really get uh, kind of dicey here is on the Swahili coast. And I want to, okay. And I look for Vasco da Gama here, and I'm not seeing, I see in Diaz. 
was trying to find a map here, and I'm not finding it. Let me see where I want to go. This uh, this is what Diaz found. He he finally gets around. He he gets here to what he calls the Cape of Good Hope, and he sees there's nothing but open ocean in front of him. And uh, uh, this is where T Cape Town, the capital of South Africa, is today. It's the beginning of South Africa as a major uh, point for contr control in the east-west uh, trade routes that, that occur. And Diaz is the first guy that gets, the first European that gets uh, down here around the coast, and he reports back that it's clear sailing to the uh, Indian Ocean there. Uh, I'm going to have to go to Da Gama. I don't see his name here. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for here. The Gama picks up where um, Diaz left off. Uh, in 1498, Vasco da Gama achieves what Prince Henry had been trying to do a hundred years later. Not, not quite a hundred years later, but it took a, a, a century. Uh, what da Gama did was he sailed out wider into the Atlantic, uh, landed uh, at the bay here, made a couple tentative stops here, picking up supplies, and then as he comes along the coast here, and remember this is the Swahili coast, he finds these very prosperous uh, cities where he does a little bit of trading, but he gets some information and he gets, finds out he, he lucks out and the monsoon winds take him to Calcutta and then to Goa. Now, remember, I said these were stock companies. When the Gama got back to Portugal, from this voyage that was up on the document camera, he sold what he had picked up in India for 400 times what he paid for it. And for the investors, they received a profit of 40 to 1. So if they put $1,000 in, they got $40,000. Now, what does this mean? It means it's open season for the voyage of discoveries. That they're not out there looking to discover, and, and, and it's always important to remember, that's a very Western biased term, age of discovery. Nobody, nothing's really discovered. They're, they're already occupied. What is discovered by Europeans is a way that they can get around the age-old trade routes and turn a profit, which they did in spades. But you can't discover territories that are already occupied. And it's kind of a biased, pro-Western kind of analogy when you call it the age of discovery. But for lack of a better term, we continue uh, to use that term. Uh, for the Americas, it's more appropriately the European arrival in the Americas. Uh, here, it's the European discovery of a route to India. But going back here, Portugal and Spain, warlike cultures, coming out of centuries of Reconquista, the petty warfare of the Middle Ages. And the Gama reports back that these are small city-states here along the way. And uh, we could go in with a small force, go in and take over. And over the next 50 years or so, that's what they attempted to do. 
uh, and I say attempted to do, because while they were able to militarily defeat each of these city-states, their goal was to take over the trade. Not only were they going to dominate this trade, which had been monopolized by the Swahili coast for a long time, their intent was to monopolize this trade into interior Africa. But we'll go back to why the Bantu culture emerged in the first place. The Swahili could speak to the Arabs. The Swahili could speak to Africans. They themselves were Africans or hybrid African uh, Arab. And they were able to facilitate the trade. Well, here come the Portuguese who speak Portuguese, not Arabic, not any Bantu, and not any Swahili. Plus, they are aggressive Christians trying to... Uh, forced conversion to Christianity, and basically this trade breaks down. And so besides the depopulation of Africa, the east-west trade routes that had been so prosperous and the north-south trade routes that had been prosperous all fall, fall apart. And uh, economically, this southeast coast of Africa has really never uh, recovered from those uh, attacks by the Portuguese and the destruction of the trade, etc. Uh, this country here, Somalia, is always in the headlines, and it's probably the least governed area anywhere in the world in terms of uh, being able to be a, a cohesive economic and cultural entity. And it's a, it all grows out of this uh, age of discovery uh, kind of impact. So that uh, kind of wraps us up here. Uh, with where we are, is that Af Africa has this heyday in the medieval period, but as the early modern period uh, comes about, uh, they experience a uh, significant demise. And what happens in this age of discovery is the Sahara kingdoms are bypassed, the Swahili coast is destroyed, the Middle East becomes more and more bypassed, uh, China is able to hold out because the Spanish, as they're coming across the Pacific, stop and trade with China, and China actually had an economic heyday for a couple hundred years uh, after the Age of Discovery, uh, but eventually uh, it suffered as well. India, relatively prosperous, uh, but uh, instead of being taken over by the Mughals, the Muslim empires coming from the north, they're eventually taken over uh, by the British. Though economically, uh, things don't change uh, all that much in India. Uh, though, again, the great advantage goes to first the uh, Portuguese, then the French, and then finally uh, the British there. Now, uh, where I'll go to next, and then we'll transition out now, uh, again, your identifications will come out of chapters 13 and 14 for your final. I'll give you a list of 10 uh, from chapter 13, you'll identify three. I'll give you a list of 10 uh, from chapter 14, you'll identify three. It'll be five points each and 30 points on your exam. So most of the stuff I've written down on the board, et cetera, or the things I've emphasized in the lecture is what I'm going to, uh, to talk about or what I'm going to ask you to know for those identifications. But the uh, age of discovery. Okay. It comes out of the Renaissance. And it comes out of the Renaissance becomes because of the rise of science. Is that for whatever reason, those principles of Pythagoras, Pythagoras uh, of Euclid, um, the philosophies of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, etc., took a hold and created a, a culture, certainly not at all levels, but at the upper levels, where science came to be uh, exalted over all other forms of learning. And it's the evolution from scholasticism to humanism. And that's where I'll uh, pick up the next lecture. Uh, hopefully I'm not totally frustrated. <laughs>
then uh, and, and this one will record because this is the second time I'm doing this. So let me stop this.